First up is verification that the meeting was properly posted. Uh, yes, it was. Thank you very much. Next up is opportunity for citizens to speak. Is there anybody who would like to address the committee? No, seeing none, I will move on to our action items for the evening. First action item is approval of minutes from the June meeting. I'll be looking for a motion. I so move. Thank you. And a second. Branchek, any discussion? Questions, concerns? Nothing? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. 4 0. Moving on to approval of vouchers. There was one voucher question, but unfortunately, I didn't see it um, in enough time to answer it for this meeting. So I think I'll answer it, um, and maybe it could go out on the Friday, Friday update. update. It had to do with legal fees, and it's going to require a little more investigation than I'm able to. Oh, I have the answer to that. He, he oh, knows well, the then go for it. <laughs> <laughs> question was asked about. Um, the Oakdale property and the account, the offers that we'll be talking about later on, mm -hmm. the legal fees incurred so far, and it's at roughly fifteen thousand dollars. I don't remember the exact amount, but okay. Excellent. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Related to the vouchers, I, I asked them, but All right, are looking for a motion to approve the vouchers? Anyone? I'll move. Thank you. Thank you. A second. Grand check. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Four zero. Moving on to approval of contract changes in the Waukesha Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Academy. Difference in my totals. We had to make a couple changes. Okay. Um, so we're just bringing it back. So you guys have the red line version, and I sent you a summary. <coughs> they were all little changes. We sent our contract into DPI. And they came back with just a couple of minor changes that we had to make. But since we had to change the contract, we wanted to bring it back just so right. that you guys were aware of it. So it's just the, um, the admissions criteria. We didn't have any listed. It just said that it was uh, an agreement between the school, district, or the school board and the governing board for Waukesha STEM. Uh, they wanted something more specific in there. So we just added the line of admission criteria completed uh, by completing the Waukesha STEM application and taking a tour of the school in which applying, which is what our process is. So it's <coughs> as simple as that. That's all we did is add that language for that, and that's on page 8 if you're looking for that in the version. Yep. Um, then for enrollment priority, I know that that was a conversation that we had as part of the first time that we did this. We... Uh, there was a lot of discussion about priority, and according to DPI, according to charter contracts, we cannot single out only kindergarten. We have to give all siblings priority. Um, that is non-negotiable with charter contracts, so we changed the language to be that it was all siblings have priority. Now, obviously, we have to have space at that, so it's not that someone can bump someone else out. I know that that was a concern. And it is optional for us, for the administrators or teachers or staff, and we did leave that out because the board wanted us to not have that priority for staff to have that. So we left that out, which was fine from DPI's standpoint, but we did have to add in. So it's not just a kindergarten, all siblings have priority when we do the lottery. So we added that language, and, or actually just changed that. So you'll see that on page eight after the admissions criteria, so you'll see those changes. And the last one was a really easy one. Just the wrong dates were in the term of the contract. Because when I added the dates, I did the date of your meeting when you approved it, and it needed to go from July 1 to June 30th. So in their eyes, our contract was longer than five years. So we just had to move it to July 1st. So those were the only changes. And there weren't, and like I said, the changes were mandated by DPI. Right. Alrighty. Questions? Yes. Yes. So the, the packet or the what we have in our packet is accurate? Correct. Okay. Yes. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. right. And then as soon as um, you, if you approve it tonight, it'll go to the board and then they'll sign off and then I'll sign a, com I'll send a complete copy to DPI. Anything else? Questions, concerns? Okay. Looking for a motion approve the Waukesha Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math Academy Charter School 
contract. As amended. Amended. Well, it hasn't been. This is it, though. We with, didn't amend with, anything here. Yeah, with the changes yeah, compared the changes. to when right. we approved it last time. Yes. And I so move. And you so move. Thank you very much. I'll second. second. Thank you. And one last time. Any questions? No? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None. Four zero. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate all your work on that. All righty. Oh, uh, yeah, busy, right, yeah. exactly. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. All righty. That concludes our action items for the evening. Next up is information items, which would be our monthly budget report. Okay. Here we go. This is a report on where we were at for June 30th. As of the time of the writing of this report, things change daily as we get they new do. invoices in. But I just want to kind of highlight some of the, the things that we're still expecting or things that we're not expecting. So if we look at the, the local revenues, um, we have, you know, tax payments are our big payments. It looks like we've collected the full tax payment, but we do um, have payments coming in July and August. We have to book, are you familiar with the concept of receivables? I know there's newer people to the, the where we have to take what we're still expecting to receive that belonged in 1819. We have to book it back to that. And when the money comes in, we pay it out of, I mean, we put it into um, a different asset account so that it shows up in all of our DPI reporting coming into the correct year. So all the taxes have been booked as a receivable and we'll still be getting uh, payments in July and August. Um, uh, let's see. The rev track revenue was not recorded yet, and so we have an additional. I know the, one of the questions on this report has always been the student fees, and are we doing okay with those because they looked a little low in the beginning. We um, caught up a lot, and we had of an additional 26000 between student fees and textbook fees that didn't get into this report yet for this for June because the rev track payment didn't get entered in the timely in, in the time we needed it to this we had a pretty tight turnaround because of the holiday on this particular report so I think those two are going to come in very close to their budgeted amount um, we also don't have in here yet the LGIP June interest we just found that to, that just came through today so that'll be added in so we have you know some additional revenues we expect to be seeing um, for local sources the intermediate and um, interdistrict sources the final open enrollment numbers are in um, we had more open ins than anticipated so we had some additional revenue there um, OE is just one of those budgeting things where we never know and it fluctuates all year long it goes back and forth and up and down and so we try to be very conservative on our budgeting there and um, it came in better than we expected state sources um, we received our transportation aid, uh, an additional amount based on um, when there, we had an audit, uh, transportation audit, and then some of the numbers changed a little bit and we got additional payments. Uh, we have received our final AGR payment and let's see, we're still expecting several grant payments to come in yet. Um, title, we put in all the final grant um, claims but the receivables weren't booked yet at the time of this but we're still expecting money coming in there uh, we also are anticipating um, we have a computer aid the final computer aid payment it looks like we're way short on the com computer aid payment on the report but this year it was two different payments a personal property tax payment which was new this year and the computer aid and it all went into the same source code so the computer aid comes in July so that'll be booked as a receivable soon um, let's see, what else are we still getting? Uh, school safety grants, those we're putting in the, um, we have about $450,000 to claim yet on that, and that'll be in by Friday, because that fiscal report is due. Um, federal sources, again, we have just some uh, grant payments, but nothing else that we're expecting. Overall, our general fund is, um, in really good shape from a revenue perspective. We've collected more revenue than we had expected. We had some surprises and some windfalls, so um, it was a good year that way. From an expense perspective, the salaries and benefits, all 1819 payroll is on the books with just a few exceptions of some timesheets that 
um, come in a little bit late. Um, the salary accounts were slightly over budget, um, but the benefit accounts were under budget. So they kind of helped to wash each other out and give us a, a good ending with salary and benefits combined. Um, personal services, mainly our big open enrollment bill came out in June for that, our open enrollment out. Um, but again, we have more ins than we have outs, so our net is very good with open enrollment. Um, we have our bus bills are coming in really late, so we do have about $1.2 million in bus bills that have to be paid yet that aren't on this re reflected on this report. Um, other than that, um, the non-capital objects, it's looking significantly under budget, but those are the site accounts, and so a lot of that is becomes their carryover, so that money gets carried over and sent back to them, anything in their site, so it doesn't contribute to fund balance in any way. The capital objects is showing under budget, but we're still getting in invoices from projects, so we fully expect to have that expended. No debt retirement in June. Um, insurance in judgment, um, it's showing significantly under budget, but part of that is due to the Summit View insurance claim that gets put back into that account. So it's showing that it's underspent, but um, there may be still some bills coming in for that that will bring that category back up again. Uh, we're still determining the final transfer to Fund 27 to make Fund 27 whole. Uh, as soon as we have that, we'll get that booked and we'll have a better year ending um, at the next meeting. Uh, let's see. Other objects, um, not expecting much else to come into there. Right now, if you look in this report, it looks very exciting because it's looking like there's a $22 million surplus. <laughs> that won't be there in, in, July, in August. <laughs> that, again, most of that is your Fund 27 transfer amount plus $1.2 million in bus bills. So there's still a lot of things that have to come together to get the final <sighs> June ending. Um, Fund 27 just quickly received our final spec ed payment. Uh, we expect we received a little bit less than expected this year, um, and then some of that is just less expenditures um, from last year at the time that we did the budget than we had expected. Uh, final, we do have some final grant payments to be booked as receivables. Salaries and benefits came in under budget from an expense perspective. Um, helps to offset the less aid that we received. Purchase services, um, looks under budget, but again, we have bus bills in for special education to pay, so I anticipate that one's gonna end up where it needs to be. Um, overall, we've spent 97% um, percent of our special education budget with just a few more things to pay for, but I think um, we're gonna come in in a good position for Fund 27 also by the time everything comes in. Before I go on to the other reports, are there questions or anything that you had on the budget report itself? Any areas of, of concern? I tried to hit anything that looked a little mm -hmm. off. Any questions? I do. Yes, Corey. Uh, the two hundred fifty thousand special education funding, primarily due to less. We get reimbursed from the prior year, so at the time that we put the budget in, you're still finalizing all the final payments and you get an estimated aid from DPI, an estimated aid number, and the time that that went in, um, it was showing that we are going to get more aid because our expenditures were budgeted to be higher than they ended up being last year. So it's kind of a retroactive thing that you're getting paid upon. Um, we did last month adjust that. It just didn't get in here. But we approved a budget revision because to adjust for that, and it just didn't get updated into Skyward yet. Mm -hmm. Yep. The, the handicap aid's a percentage of eligible costs, so if you spend a little less, it it moves up and down with your expenditures, so. Problem. Anything else? Okay, let's take a look at the, um, well, the tax collection. It, this report does show how much we have left coming from, that's on page 
17. Uh, we still have 12 million coming and that'll be coming in in July and August. We don't anticipate any issues with that at all. Um, but then the next page is our health claims payable. And we're right now showing that we're ending with a, a good solid balance of 1.7 million. There's a few trickle in things that need to come off of here yet, but I still anticipate it coming in around 1.7. Our um, insurance consultants gave us a figure of, was it 14.6? I think 14.6 for our IBNR, which is the claims that have already been incurred that need to come out of here yet, but they haven't been paid yet. So we'll be getting those trickling in over, um, and we need to carry that IBNR over. So we look to end up in a very good position with our health claims payable, and we can probably put some of that money back into the fund balance of the reserve for claims. It was a better year than last year. Okay. That is all I had on that, but I wanted to point out one thing um, on the voucher approval. Sorry, I'm going to go back for a second. Because the investment report is attached to the back of the voucher approvals, and I wanted to point out that this month we did add in our referendum money. So this balance does include the money that we've received so far for the referendum. That's why the capital projects amount looks so high. But I just wanted to point that out because it's quite a leap over the last months. So. Um, Right now we have that in WISC, the Wisconsin Investment Series Cooperative, and they in turn, in consulting with Darren and I, they go out and they um, make recommendations on where we're gonna invest that money and different, all the money is spread out right now over different investment vehicles with different time frames um, for we, when, you know, their CDs, treasury bills, things like that, and they all have different um, maturity time frames on them in looking at how we need to have the money available for our spend down on our projects. So it can't really put in an, um, an interest rate on this one because it's varying depending on what investment vehicle the money's in. We could certainly work on getting a breakdown, but it would be quite complex and lengthy. If you want to see that, I can certainly work with PMA and get that every month if you want to see our investment schedule in detail. Certainly able to do that. We're actually having PMA come to the board meeting Wednesday just because of investments and that was an important topic that the board really understand what our approach is. And it, with WISC, one of the reasons we're technically with so many banks is we're trying to stay under the $250,000 FDIC limit. So the majority of our funds are um, fully insured or collateralized, but most of them are under FDIC. But if you look at the list of all the banks, you kind of wonder why are you doing that? And that's why you need someone like WIST to get into that network so you can stay under that um, insurance threshold. So They also have our drawdown schedule so they know mm -hmm. when we're going to need the money and they make recommendations based on that and they're constantly keeping up with what are the best rates so as things mature and if there's opportunity to reinvest. And, and they're doing the arbitrage calculations to make sure because we can't earn too much interest. Yeah, so we don't make too much money. Right. Right. So... But but I just, I, oh, oh. So I just yeah, so that's so. coming Wednesday to the full board because I thought everyone should hear it or, or Patrick and I agreed on that. Yep, definitely. No, I just wanted to mainly point out that that money is now going to be appearing on here so you'll see that. And that I am done. Is that it? That's that report. Fantastic. <laughs> I believe I'm up much. next too. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a roll. I Any know. questions related to the monthly budget report? Anybody? No? Okay. Moving on to our update of the 1920 preliminary budget and tax levy. Okay, so this is at a stage where things are continually changing. This was all done before the final state budget was signed. So now we have that picture and we know um, some of the pieces of the puzzle are starting to fit in. I think we but should thank the governor for waiting until right after we mailed the packet out to sign this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's shout out to nice Governor time. Evers for mm -hmm. his actions. So if we turn to this page, 
this is kind of what we're going to be discussing and working off of. And this particular document shows us the scenarios. It shows us where we were at this year for 1819, and then it shows us a couple scenarios. Scenario A is no change in state aid. That's the current scenario that we have our preliminary budget built on. Then there is the a document that comes out on July 1st that gives us what the state thinks our aid may be. It's never quite exactly what's on that document, but on that particular scenario, it's showing a 4.67% increase in state aid. Now, the thing to keep in mind is increased state aid doesn't necessarily mean more money for us because that all comes out of our revenue limit. So we have X amount of dollars to bring in, and it comes from different ways, right? Um, thing, there's certain things that fall within the revenue limit and other things that fall outside of it that don't affect it. Equalization aid is one of those things that if you get more money from the state, what you can, what you levy is just lower. So the nice thing is it's better for our taxpayers when we get more state aid, doesn't bring more money into the district. So I just want to point that out. It just changes where the numbers fall on the page. but. So that preliminary, this is before the budget was signed, um, preliminary aid was estimated at 4.67%, and then scenario C was one we kind of a standard one we do, what if we drop 2%, what would that mean? And a um, couple things they did this year, there's, we get a per member amount, and this year they're adding $175 to that per member amount, which increases our revenue limit. Now. What it shows on here is that we got an, extra, an additional revenue of, or uh, added to our revenue limit of 2.168250. Doesn't really come out to that. It really comes out to about $826,000 because we were, because we're in declining enrollment, we had an exemption called hold harmless. And it looked at where you were at from the prior year and where you're at this year, and it gave you an exemption, which in the past, you can see here, was about um, $1.2 million. Well, when they upped the per member revenue to by this additional $175, it took us out of the hold harmless arena. So we lost that exemption. So while it looks on this paper that we've got an extra 2.1 million from this, it really just, it gave us an extra. I mean, overall we have the 2.1 mm -hmm. million, but it's this $175 is only contributing 800 of that because of the hold harmless going away. Does that make sense? It's kind of a confusing. The whole you'll get the money, you're just getting it in a different way. Correct. Yeah, yeah, we're just, we're just not getting $175 per pupil. Right. right. Um, it, yeah, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. Thank you. In the long run, and we've talked about this before, you want to get out of those exemptions so when you, your enrollment does swing back, you know, they're, they're designed to help you ease into lower enrollment, but they also weight you down as you start you're growing. Back um, so eventually you want to get out of there. This is just kind of moving us fast in one year. Yeah. Um, so we're we're losing that one point two or one and a quarter million dollars, um, and this is all dated information because now we actually have a governor's budget. But um, we think we can make that up with um, where the per pupil aid is ending up under what was signed this weekend. So, right overall, I think we're in a, a good spot. Agreed. I agree. There's two sides. There's also a declining enrollment exemption that we still have. There's two different sides to that. Um, we looked at uh, this particular budget assumes a loss of an average 139 members. That's over a three-year average. Um, so we're anticipating our enrollment still going to decline. Um, we're estimating on this particular one the same number of choice because we do get um, an exemption for the number of the amount of money going out for choice, but it is a wash because it's just the same amount on our expense side. So it doesn't really, for the sake of this discussion, any if they if that changes, it's just going to change on the um, expense side too. So it doesn't really impact uh, that greatly. Um, but overall, our revenue limit decrease is three hundred and one thousand dollars this year over um, last year. The overall, whoops, wait a minute, that mm -hmm. doesn't seem right. Oh, that'd be right. 
Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Looking at the wrong columns. So it's dropped a little bit. Um, Again, that's driven by lost, fewer kids. Correct. Even though we're getting $175 more per kid, we're having fewer kids. So right. We're into yeah, budgeting. So going down to the bottom half, which is, kind of looks at our state aid, um, the equalization aid varies based on what scenario we're looking at. We have computer aid and personal property aid. We held to last year's numbers because we're not really sure quite yet what um, we'll be seeing there. So you can see our levies under, we have Fund 38, Fund 41, um, and Fund 10 are the three levies that fall underneath that revenue limit. So our other items like Fund 39 and Fund 80, Fund 39 being the new referendum, and Fund 80 being our community service, those fall outside of the revenue limit. They allow us, because they're approved by the public to, at least Fund 39 approved by the public, allow us to go outside of our revenue limit. Um, so, but they all in, um, add up to the tax levy, all of them. And so we're looking at last year's rate of 7.8. Right now we're looking at 8.55, which is within the range of, we're telling people 70, is that? 72 cents. 72. That's 75. I do expect that this is going to show a little bit better because we only in, um, anticipate paid a 1.5% increase in property value, which usually goes a little bit more in our favor. So I, I expect that this number in the end is going to come down and along with some of the other budget changes that we see coming across, like per pupil aid increase right. well, um, was good for us. There's a, there's a lot of state aid, equalization aid, and um, language in the state budget. And the problem of deciphering that is they talk about it on a statewide pool of money, not Waukesha specific. They do some estimates. So normally, just to give, I guess, mainly Corey some background here, normally we roll out three aid um, scenarios plus 2% flat and then minus 2%. I think this scenario C is off the table from what we're reading. I don't think there's going to be a drop of 2%. Um, somewhere between no change and I would say 5% is kind of the range we're looking at. So, be, so between what we think is going to be higher aid than what's in scenario aid and higher valuation um, will be well within that 72 cent referendum um, target. So, yeah, cool, definitely. Um, no, I because again, this all factors in 1.5 percent valuation growth. Um, we've been averaging around three, yeah, I want to yeah. say, the last three, handful three, of years. Yeah. So, because um, I'll, I'll tell my secret on TV. I tend to come in with a little higher rate in September so we can come back in October when we finalize everything and be just a little lower. <laughs> um, so I, I would guess at this point that we would be, yeah. <laughs> so, so there's two more people in Waukesha that know that, the, yeah. our viewers. Um, I would say somewhere between, and I hate to, I would say somewhere between 850 and $8 would be my, if you ask me just a ballpark uh, number. Now maybe valuations really taken off, maybe you get a four and a half percent. I mean, I don't know, the economy is booming. I don't know if that equates to. I don't know if that equates to property. It's not that simple, so. Yeah, right, exactly. Expression in Waukesha. But I think us being able to be within 72 cents of right. last year's rate, even though uh, I think that's looking like it's doable. So all this work that we've done, we'll be going back and redoing it in August we'll have all new numbers, but this is just to say, hey, look, we're in the ballpark, we're working on a balanced budget, we've got changes to make. But if you look on like page eight, this is the 25 year um, mill rate history. And if you look back to, I mean, 16, 17, so just four years ago, we are at 8.66. So we've been going down and now we're just going up because of the approved referendum. So. Um, we're still going to fall under what we are at and most likely fall under what we are at in 16, 17 with the referendum money coming in. So, so overall, it's a good picture, and I think it's going to be a better picture once we continue to update for the new information that we received. Some of the highlights from the state budget that we received increased to per pupil aid, which per pupil, there's the... There's the per member adjustment inside the revenue limit that was $175, but then you've got your per pupil aid, which falls outside of the revenue limit, which is really helpful when they increase that in um, 
it was going into this budget, we were anticipating 654, and it's gone up to 742 per member. And um, our average is 12, uh, 12,390 that we're working off of for the aid. So um, that's a significant increase in giving us more money than we had anticipated in this budget. So that's a good thing. Um, we are losing the, they added a new um, aid this year for technical, um, Devices, that is going away now. They pulled that from the budget. It was about $122,000. Um, open enrollment is going up by $331 per student, which is good for us if our open enrollment numbers continue because we've got um, a very positive trend of having more open enroll students in than out. So that's a good thing. Um, so just a lot of fun things to look forward to in the next month as we rework this with our new estimates. Um, this I emailed uh, yesterday, and I don't know if you had time to see it. It basically talks, of, it shows on some of our major funds what um, what were our revenues across the years, and then what, and I handed this out, so everybody should have it. And then our um, what our expenditures were. When you look at the general fund in Fund 27, though, the one thing that's not in here, so the comparison isn't um, perfect is that we don't have the grants in here yet. And so while it looks like at 144 million, we're um, significantly coming in under what we had last year, but the grants are not budgeted in here yet. But again, that's, um, that's an in and out. There's whatever we budget on the revenue side is gonna be on the expense side. So it doesn't affect our contribution to fund balance. It just affects that final number. Does that make sense? Yes, Karen. When you're counting the open enrollments, are you counting that third Friday count? That's when you get the actual numbers? Um, I go off of what our final year ends up being because we have that third Friday count, and that's where our, um, our final budget comes in with that third Friday count when we put the final budget in because we usually have that by the time we're getting that ready. Um, but by the end of the year, it's a whole different number usually. Open enrollment's fluid throughout the year. Some kids go back to their home school or they sign up for us. and It's not seismic shifts normally, but. No, but it, it'll be crazy. All of a sudden you'll look and you're off 60 kids from where you were yeah. the last time. And it's FTEs though. So suddenly there'll be a students leaving and, and a lot of it is the achieve because that's where most of our open enrollment comes from. So they'll get students coming in midstream and students leaving deciding it just wasn't for them leaving midstream. But overall, um, Let's see, I've got my open enrollment number here. Um, yeah, there's a graph of the open enrollment. I think it's the last page. Yes, but my, um, we came in with, and this is FTEs. This isn't the number of students. It's the number of, you know, when you add up how many students are here part of the year and full year and then divide it out to get a full FTE. Is it full-time equivalent? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, right. correct. Because yeah, a lot of um, kids take one class or... A combination of a couple. Right. So, okay. So we, we ended up the year, and this is the final total and what we got paid in for and what we paid out. Um, we had 891 students coming in, or FTEs coming in, and 640 going out um, for a net positive of 251 students, or FTEs, excuse me, which is a great number. You know, that's pretty significant. Um, if that trend changes, then things it'll look as good, but we've got a long history of more students coming in than going out. And each of does contribute to a lot mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, brick and mortar open enrollment, school to school, we're negative, but EHE brings us, okay. in, in, in terms of dollars, is a graph at the back page that mm -hmm. we all used to talk about that. Yep. That puts it into um, the back page of your executive summary. And this is where we're getting an increase of $331 per student for next year. So that's a good thing. So overall, we expect to be able to come back in August with a balanced budget updated with all the items from the um, state budget being finalized. Do we get, when do we get, don't we get the um, land values in July, don't we? Um, August, I think they come in August. August? Okay. I would say September 1 or something. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that might still be at an estimate of 1.5%, but 
for the final budget, we'll have it. But what we bring back in August will be getting closer. And we'll also in August be able to look at where we landed for um, June or end, uh, end of the 18-19 fiscal year. Questions? Mrs. Voigt. How common or uncommon is it to have the actual budget approved by close to July 1? Well, for c common school districts, um, you have to have an annual meeting knowing it used to be the annual meeting the people voted and that was the vote. Now, once revenue limits came on, the board has the authority to tax an appropriate level to sustain the program or some language such as that. Um, but everyone rolls out a preliminary budget in anywhere from, and it's gotten later and later because the state budget cycles, you know, especially under split control, get approved later and later. Um, so normally someone's out in June through August, um, early September with a preliminary budget and then the board's asked to act at the end of October on the final, final budget. Because then you have certified aid, you have your third Friday pupil count in September, um, all that data comes rolling in um, and you can finalize the calculations. So we think we're budget balanced and I'm here to tell you that all the numbers you see here will be shifted <laughs> slightly because yes. we have to go back and and calculate out what the, the true impact of the state budget is. And stuff's just kind of trickling out um, in terms of the detail, so. Fund 80, what are we using that for? Fund 80 has a couple of things. Um, String Academy is in there. Okay. Um, that, the enrollment in String Academy just seems to decrease every year, and that's one of those things that I think Excellent. the board needs to make a decision right. on whether or not you want to continue to support that. Um, the current contract, I believe, calls for up to $30,000, so that's what we budget for, but we have run out of the fund balance for that. Um, and so if anything that we want to support with that is going to be levied. So right now it's in there, part of the levy for the 30,000, but I think they only had like 12,000 um, in student, $12,000 in fees this year that we paid. So we could look at changing the contract to lowering that amount, or we could eliminate the program. Um, that's one of the things that the board will And it's our decide. understanding that the board at one time authorized that contract until fund balance was expended. So that was one question we had for the committee um, as we move forward in August is where do we where do we stand yeah, with that? And that's why I wonder about the community service fund because I mean a while ago we wanted to kill that thing completely. Right. Yep. I, Twenty thousand dollars in that thing at one time, mm -hmm. and now it looks like there's a substantial amount of money in there. And what else is in there is the SR part of the SRO contract, so fifty percent of the SRO. Okay. Contract is what makes up the majority of that. That's our student resource officers. It's uh, an agreement with the police department, and 50% um, of that charge goes to community service because it works with that. And then um, the other two items in there are the community library liaison, that, okay, um, yep. that new position from this year. And then the last item is 50% of our community liaison person, um, Maria Peters, as part of the a bilingual. Um, in the bilingual department, it's now part of our bilingual program. She works with outreach into the community, um, and that's half of her salary is paid out of there. So it's those four components that go, and that those are the only four things that get paid for out of there. So half the SRO is being paid for out of the community service? Of the, the other contract. half in Fund 10. How long have we been doing that for? Out of the community Two service? Two years. Fund? Two years, okay. Yeah. I thought it went back. Oh, I think it's, this oh, is the it's third. When we added the, the third year. When we added the um, middle school cool. one officer. Okay. Do we have six SROs in the budget right now, or did we leave it at four? Uh, whatever the contract was that year. Yeah, I think we might have in there an item we'll be discussing here in yes. a few minutes. Right. Um, we don't have a, an, a well. We have an agreement for four SROs with the city. Um, we've had the goal or ongoing discussions of going to six, so you'd have three at the three middle schools and three at the high school. Um, but um, so like we'd have to double check where we end up with that. But I think our discussion later on in the agenda will help Just us know what to it. put into the budget. So yeah, okay. if anything, it would go down because I'm pretty sure it was the I full think it was amount. the six. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we wanted sure. to give you our potential. 
yeah. tax impact or tax levy. So I think I did include it. I believe you did too. So just half of the current SRO contract is. We would look to continue the 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 fifty percent split. Um, okay. We're hoping to be able to do that. We're waiting to kind of see how the state budget yeah. um, came out. Um, well, I know it's very popular to fund the whole thing out of it right now with school districts. I know Elmbridge a lot of districts did. are. Very slow. Um, just did. Their That's how they, I mean, they just got their SROs. Appleton, we Elmbridge, covered the whole sorry. thing in a fun 80. Uh, Elmbrook's, I think. They just got theirs. Yes. And they funded the whole have, thing out of the community service fund. I, at least a portion. I didn't see the percentage, but I think it was all of it. And there are, if you go on DPI's website, there are guidelines out there, and I think we do meet those guidelines. Right. But like any guidelines, like having a bunch of attorneys look at you, what's my client want? Interpretation. And I can, <laughs> you know, what you know, not the a lot of interpretation of those. They're very, the they're very wide. Um, yes. Guidelines. Yeah. They're not as specific as you probably yeah. think. I read them. And they're um, vague at best. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Any other questions? All righty. Thank you very much. Moving on to our next information item, depository listing. Oh, I guess that's me again. Exciting. So. <laughs> yeah. I had pointed out that in my local government pool, I kind of left a uh, sentence there with suspense at the very <laughs> last um, when I was writing that. So I apologize for that if you read through this. Um, it was a quiz to see who read. <laughs> Diane wins. Um, this is just mainly a summary of what financial institutions do we use currently and um, what do we use them for. Each one has a very different purpose. And so um, right now we have three main depositories. One is Waukesha State Bank. They're our main everyday in and out. We write our checks out of Waukesha State Bank accounts, our daily deposits go into Waukesha State Bank. Um, it's it's set up in a way where there's multiple accounts that work against each other to add extra security that so that our money isn't at any um, big risk at any time because of the way that the money transfers back and forth. I guess I don't want to get into too much detail on that, <laughs> but it's a very secure environment for our banking. Um, all of our accounts payable, payroll, tax levy deposits, daily cash receipts, that all comes in. Also, all of our student activity accounts are um, housed at Waukesha State Bank. Local government investment pool, that um, is where all of our DPI um, money goes. So our equalization aid, anything that we're getting payments through DPI, they're putting into the local government investment pool. We have no vehicles to write checks off of there or anything, it's a very secure environment. <coughs> The only thing we're set up to currently do is transfer money to Waukesha State Bank to a specific account. In order to change that would require both Darren and I's signature, so it's a very safe place we keep. It has um, generally a, a little bit better interest return than Waukesha State Bank, so we try to keep money in there as much as possible. It accumulates all year long, and then summer is when we need to start pulling it. When our other revenues start to um, run out, um, then we start pulling money over, and then the tax money comes in later and replenishes the Waukesha State Bank. Um, Right now, we don't have any, Waukesha State Bank is good in that they don't charge us transfer fees for anything coming in on um, out of the government investment pool. Then we've added WISC, the Wisconsin Investment Series Cooperative. This is right now the only <coughs> thing there. Um, we have a small, I think $1,100 just to keep that open that's been out there, but now we've added um, two other uh, accounts for our referendum money. One is the debt service account where money to pay the debt service has gone into. Um, we had a premium, uh, a rebate from the closing and that money went into the debt service side of it. And then the other side is the money that's available to us for spending. Um, we will, as we pay things, we'll be requesting transfers from them, and they'll be transferring money right over to Waukesha State Bank as needed. But all in all, I feel like our investments are very secure, and we do what we can to maximize the interest that we get from our money uh, by managing where the money flows between these accounts. 
Yeah, I had to um, agendize this just because, A, we have all the referendum proceeds, and um, but also uh, if you're a, um, a common school district, you have an annual meeting where you actually, the board mm -hmm. approves the list of depositories. And I thought, because when Sherry and I got in our positions now, we there was a few accounts that were out there. We've closed down several that I'm sure at one point served a very valuable pur purpose. But then I was thinking, you know, the board should know Mm -hmm. or the committee and, and board via the packet, I guess, um, where our money is. And um, so I thought we'd throw it out there just as a quick check as to let you know um, what we're doing with uh, with the funds. So right. Johnson Bank was one that we had another relationship with. Wells Fargo we, was one. Um, but Johnson Bank started just killing us with fees. I mean, it became ridiculous. And their interest rate, Waukesha State Bank, um, really upped their game for us. They want our business and treat us very well. They upped the interest rates that um, we're getting uh, with uh, some of the ways they set up the different collateralized accounts. And so it it's to our <coughs> advantage to keep money there because we were making better returns on it, plus we didn't have all the fees. And so we eliminated that extra place for having money. Any question about the depository listings? All right, thank you very much. Next up is referen referendum projects update. Yeah, we are um, three or four weeks into construction now, so we're well under underway. Um, so this is a, a, a monthly report that we've been been given um, the board, and I've, I've included a few documents. One, a, a paper um, from the. Uh, Waukesha Freeman, an article that was in the paper um, a few weeks ago on June 25th that we're trying to keep the dialogue out there in the community and keeping them up to date. And then attached to that is um, Bray Architects does a um, progress report. Um, and we're, we're really already focusing on the summer of 20 and 21. Um, so there's a, a nice one-page summary. And then Findorf every week comes out with uh, an executive summary report on the current construction um, going on out at the sites. All these are um, on the district's website. I don't know if anyone's been out there um, recently, but we've been trying to keep that updated with the articles and um, the updates. We, um, I saw a, a draft of a, a video that we're going to put out of um, Tim Williamson walking through with uh, Mary Jo from our public relations office, kind of showing the, I guess, the drywall going up and him explaining. Um, and those will go explain what's going on here and why you know what's going into this space and where did that come from and um, and that'll be on the website too. So I don't know how many hits for I haven't really looked, um, but the information's out there. Um, but these are um, been in the Friday updates. I try to send out the executive summary report from Findorf every week. So um, so if anyone has any questions on the project so far, I've not heard any. Um, we've had some minor things surprising when you're in demolition. You always. <laughs> Especially when you're in older buildings, you never know what you're going to get. So we, I think we made once we made it through that phase, I felt pretty good about where we are budget-wise. Um, I've not signed off on any change orders so far, which I think means our um, our planning was pretty thorough. So, um, so if you ever want a tour, let me know. Now. Use you your hard hat so we can bring your hard hats. They are enforcing <laughs> the hard hat area. So, all right. Any questions about that? Thanks for including these uh, updates. I read them every week, so I good. Yeah, I think it's a nice, quick read. You know, you're not yeah, yeah, spending an hour. And, um, Definitely, Mrs. Voigt. I just wanted to compliment you on the website because I think it looks really good. I checked it out today. Yeah, I think it's it. It was kind of weird for a while because it was out there and we weren't in construction yet, so you really didn't have much to talk about. Um, but um, now there's a lot of photos out. Well, we're gaining photos to do more things with. Um, you know, they'll have poster boards at the uh, Waukesha County Fair and things like that to kind of advertise the things we're doing. Yep. Um, and then, of course, they'll be available on the website, too, at least some of them, some before and afters and all that. So. All right. Moving on. That concludes our information items. Next up on the agenda is our discussion items. Our first discussion item is budget hearing date. Just a, a quick one. Um, every year, and, and according to our budget calendar, uh, which is on the back side, we kind of pencil in a tentative budget hearing date. We've been targeting the September board meeting. I, uh, as far as um, we're concerned, we can stay with the date of September 11th, which is Wednesday. Um, 
for new board members, it's literally usually 15 minutes, and I'm probably giving it more time than it, it lasts, but we do it right before um, the board meeting. And it's pretty much um, a chance for the public to come in and ask any questions about the budget. I mean, they can always email me directly, but um, and it's pretty quick. But uh, we're fine with that timeline. I just want to make sure that works with the committee. So we'll come back with another update in terms of tax levy and everything next month to this committee. And that'll pr probably be the document we'll, we'll recommend come forward on the 11th for the community to consider. Any input? On those dates? Anybody? Awesome. Excellent. Next up is the school resource officer agreement. Yeah, we've been having ongoing conversations um, going back to maybe late last summer, early fall um, with the city. We've also, um, more recently, with the beginning of the calendar year, roughly, um, so in January of 2019, had some. Um, research into other vehicles of delivery of security services um, to our schools. Um, along that, while we were investigating that, we were continuing on and off with conversations with the city about SRO officers and, um, you know, I think a shared desire to have uh, more security at our middle school level um, and to bring um, an officer to each middle school. Um, and one would also extend out to uh, Randall stem too. I don't want to exclude them, but so we ended up with six FTE was our goal. So um, we, this is a tentative agreement that we had with the city back in February, but we were just entering into, um, you know, the research into some other delivery methods. So I thought I'd bring it forward. Uh, it's, it's a discussion item tonight for a purpose because I'm not sure what the board's feelings are on, um, Contracting out versus um, staying with the city. Do we do we feel we need to go to six FTE? Um, so this is. I thought I'd bring it forward just to kind of get a, a pulse of what the committee's thinking, um, to see the, the the tweaks that are in the the uh, contract, which aren't significant um, financially. If you go to um, page three, um, it's probably the easiest way. To look at it and it's um, it at the bottom of the page um, the numbers that are redlined or crossed out are what we currently are contracted to pay remember that's for four officers the numbers the red numbers next to it that are underlined are for six officers so that's the jump but we're also jumping in the percentage of um, what we pay for the officers and for just a simple look at what the contract is, if you turn to the next page, it does the math on the six officers um, in a spreadsheet for you. Um, and you'll see right now we pay about um, 47 <coughs> or 48 percent of the officers we have um, of their total compensation. Um, and that goes back to when COPS grant came out in like 2000 or something. Um, we did survey work, it's all over the board. Some police departments pay all, some districts pay 100%. I would say the average is in that 55 to 65, 70% of an officer's pay. Um, so this agreement, if you look kind of in the middle, there's SDW percentage. Um, in 1920 would have us be paying 59% and then increasing to 65% um, the final two years of a, a new five-year agreement. Why 65% if you Calculate the days worked, school days add up to 65% of the work days in a school year. Um, and that's how that percentage was um, arrived at. So that is an increase. Um, in talking to my peers in other districts, um, it's not unusual to be talking an increase because um, the costs are going up. It's also hard to compare. I think there's a little bit of a variance in that survey. If you remember geographically, it was kind of... Um, all over like Jefferson and, you know, it was, surveys are as only good as people respond, right? Um, right. So their 65% dollar wise might be, a, you know, quite a bit less because an officer in Waukesha in a metro area tends to be a little more expensive. Um, so our commitment to at six officers by the end of this agreement would be at $448,000, which would be paid for in a combination of fund 10 and fund $80. Um, so that's, um, and I tried to footnote all, and I, I put the link 
to the fund 80 guidelines at the bottom of that spreadsheet too. So if you want to go out and do a little research yourself, um, you're welcome to DPI. Actually, it's, DPI's website is a pretty good resource for a lot of things. So, um, so that's where we are in terms of SRO. So we're, I'm more than willing to listen to any guidance on how how to proceed. Um, Wait. I have two questions. Fantastic. Um, under the idea of having three FTEs shared within the four middle schools, mm -hmm. have you thought about how that would work? You know, three bodies in four buildings? Yeah. Um, I don't know if we have a specific schedule. I'd have to ask Joe Cook to answer that question in complete honesty. Um, you know, with STEM being um, a little smaller, I don't know if we could justify an officer full time being there like you have at the middle school. So, um, and right now we're sharing one officer amongst three middle schools, and so we'd figure out the logistics of that once um, we get closer. And maybe Joe's already thought of that. I don't know. And one of the things, it, it, looking at the survey, is that in some of the school districts consider summer school as well. Has yeah. there any been any thought of no, SRO we, for summer school? Our, our focus has been, to this point, of just trying to get coverage during the school year when the, the large quantity of kids are in place. And I have to say, that's the first time I've seen that. That's a newer, newer uh, offering, I guess, or service. Thank you. So this does not include six. This is all for four. This, these numbers, the school district annual cost, 2019-20. Yeah, this this spreadsheet, the one you're looking at, this is for six FTE. It's for six. Yep. Yeah, if you look in the far, the second uh, column to the right, oh, it has yes, FTE number you. right there. Thank you. Okay. So remind me why we had a falling out with the city. Or did we not have a falling out? What was happening where they said that the old contract, they were not going to uphold it anymore, and we were going to have to fund it on our own? Or yeah. what happened there that our cost is going up and theirs is coming down? Yeah, that's a good question. It's probably good just to backtrack since this has been such a lengthy conversation. Um, we have an existing contract with the city, I want to say through 21, 22, or 2021, I can't remember. Maybe it's 2021, 2021. for four officers. So when we wanted to engage them in adding the two additional officers, they wanted to open up the agreement. I had hoped for an amendment to be added to the existing um, agreement. Um, they didn't see that, and then it became a financial matter. Um, you know, they're trying to um, free up space in their budget, and I'm trying to keep our tax levy on our side as low as possible. And um, so it was back and forth with that, and then. Um, we, like I said, we came to a tentative agreement in January or February, um, but by then we had started researching other delivery methods, um, and I think conversations kind of cooled at that point. Um, and then about two months ago, I, I reached out to the city again and said, you know, where are we at? And we went back to where we were in January and February, and that led us to tonight's conversation of, you know, it's, at some point the board needs to decide how many officers, what delivery method, and give us that guidance on how to proceed. So that's. What again is the delivery method? Either to have law enforcement in there or um, okay. you know, contract company. it out. Mm -hmm. And so the contracting out, I, I think a lot of people think of kind of a mall cop. They can be fully armed, military or police trained. I mean, it. But if we want to go down that path, we need to start that education process to see right. whether that's something the board wants to consider. When once, sorry, let me just finish this thought. When you said we, they went back to the discussions in January, that was basically the no. Is that your nice way of saying no? Their funds are going down. They're not going to open it up and do an amendment. They wanted a new five-year commitment because if we were adding new if they were adding new officers they wanted to know those officers were going to be in place for more, longer than the two years remaining on our agreement so if we said we just want to add two officers and we want to keep the old payment our rash um, the ratio of 
percentage. Percentage. Mm -hmm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, they were not open to that. They were not. No. As long as we, what if we had a commitment of five years or whatever? They are looking for that percentage to be increased. Oh, our, our percentage. They've done their own surveys. They count the days. Yeah, they know how many days they're spending at that. I mean, they know it's 65%. I, I get the argument they're making. Um, I counter at, because I remember I was here when the COPS grants rolled out. One of the things was, well, first of all, they really weren't security officers in 2000. It was more building relationships, yeah. what's going on around campus, that kind of um, feel. Um, but at that time, it also brought in, you know, you're here on site, so we're not calling you all the time. Right. You know, someone's not driving to our um, mainly high schools. Um, it all started with that, and it certainly turned into more of a security thing over time, obviously. Um, and, and they look at 65% because they're counter to my argument about, well, you'd be coming to my school anyways, is, yeah, but I get the summers when they all take their vacation. You know, they're not on their... They're not driving around their squad cars or whatever they do during the summer. Um, we get the vacation and we get the training time, so we really don't get our 35% isn't as much as the working 35% as um, you might think. So, and you know, negotiations as you go round and round with those things. So, I agree. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is the district looking for input from this committee as to deciding? or I guess discussions on private contractors as opposed to police officers at this point? Because I saw in the, the summary, I guess there were three options. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, whether we continue investigating delivery models, wait until the board workshop in August, or proceed with board consideration at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we had uh, a board workshop scheduled, Todd, do you remember? End of June, wasn't it? Yeah, and it got bumped. Um, it got bumped because it's not summer and people are busy. Um, and then uh, as we were talking about it, um, a workshop in late August puts us three days before the first start of school year. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, I don't want you to want the workshop, but also have six whatever officers or whatever we come up with sitting there on the first day of school because if we're waiting to talk about it until I think August 26th or something like that, that's a tight timeline for me to turn anything around. So I thought I'd kind of bring back the history or recent history or a, a TA that we have with the um, city and see what, what are you looking for? As far as myself, I don't know I'm the new guy, but I, I watched the old videos. It, it's an important issue. We just can't afford to get it wrong. There's just no room for error. I went through... SRO duties and all of those are things that are common sense, but the most important thing is the safety of our students. It's, I liken it to, I gotta come up with a better analogy, but a fire extinguisher. You hope to never use it, but if you need it, it better, it better work. I think there is a difference between sworn law enforcement officers and contractors. I have friends that I went to college with who were vets, combat vets, extremely experienced in their contractors and they're great human beings, but there's a difference, at least in my opinion, between sworn officers who are not just there for a job. It's a profession, it's a calling, much like teachers who are there regardless. Um, so I, I do not support uh, different delivery methods. I think sworn officers is important. Um, it's just something we can't get wrong. And it, it's people you know, if the worst happens, are not gonna cut and run they're gonna show up, they're gonna be there. I support having six full-time equivalents, um, and it's, it's not cheap, obviously, uh, but I think it's money well spent. And if, if, we, if it comes down to, God forbid, the instance where the worst happens, and we look at, we save some money, it's not worth saving. The other advantage is having a police vehicle parked out front. I don't think you can put a... Yeah price on that, but I think it is important. And I think the other piece of this, too, is that we asked the public for a pretty significant amount of money to upgrade our schools to make them more safe. And, and, and while there is an increase in the, in the percentages here, um, I agree. I, I would feel far more comfortable having um, um, city walkshop police officers in our building versus any other type of security. I, I agree. And I've looked at the updates, too, is the structural improvements, the hardened yeah. entrances nothing's impenetrable and mm. it's 
ma a matter of seconds. It's but I, when we were in our, our meetings with uh, the police chiefs and the FBI and the sheriff and, you know, the FBI said if someone wants to do evil, they're going to do it. It's just a matter of how quickly you can stop them. Right. And that's, that's, I think, where we're, or how quickly you can prevent any further damage. And that's kind of our situation here. Yeah, the deterrence factor you mentioned is, is well said. And we, and we talk about this in, and this is how I look at it anyways, we talk about it in terms of 6 FTE in our buildings, but also part of this, and it shouldn't get lost in this, when we added the fourth officer um, to be shared amongst the middle schools, um, we also have an arrangement with the city where uh, a patrol officer is assigned to elementary schools. Now, they're not there all the time, but they build relationships um, with the principals. Um, they're the first contact. If you know if an issue comes up, um, a, a principal can call them. They, they, they are in our schools some. I'm not going to say they're there four days a week or anything like that, but at least there's that relationship that, that's being built. We don't factor that into the math here because we think of the bodies sitting in our schools. And um, but I think that's also a, a, a service that we we should be thinking of as we proceed um, down this conversation because you won't have that with um, a different delivery model, I don't think. And they also one of the goals was to bring a, a chance for police to have build relationships because not all people look at police as the same way these days as they used to so yeah anything else um well we brought this forward just so everybody knows where we are and what the costs are and what the contract looks like i know not a lot of people have seen the contract the question that i have though is less about the money but when i was reading the contract was duty hours Paragraph C, in the event an SRO is absent from work, the SRO shall notify his or her supervisor in the police department and the principal of the school to which the SRO is assigned. The police department will assign another qualified officer to substitute for the absent SRO beginning on the sixth consecutive day of absent. We don't have any of those schools that don't have cops in them, right? Any of those high schools. That's this guy, wait, they, they have up to six days to assign somebody? That's something I can go back and I, yeah, I don't that know the we answer. Get that rid of. And what what subset? You said C, but what? It's uh, duty hours. Four point. Oh, okay, I got you. It's just weird that it says um, the police department will assign another qualified officer to substitute for the absent SRO beginning on the sixth consecutive day of absence. Yeah, I can't believe that's happening. I don't believe because that. Because we is. had that guy at South that was out. We had. I mean, we didn't weren't missing an SRO up at South for six days. I don't believe that's the case. But, <laughs> it can't um, be the case. I mean, I, I can tell you at least, and this is maybe language that's been in every SRO agreement. Yeah, but maybe. It, it, was, it is in our current one because this is a red line of the existing contract. So, Yeah, because, um, it, well, it's, yeah, it is in the original one because I have the original one right here. The one you sent out? Yep. Yeah, it's in there. That's where I caught it, actually, is I was reading that. Okay. Um, and I just thought that was odd that it was beginning on the sixth consecutive day of absence. I mean, it's, no, it's there, and and I can't believe that would be happening. Okay. I mean, I totally get they want to recoup their costs. Sixty-five percent is obviously how much time they're spending on. But we were talking about because I know that Mr. O'Brien's concern was that the the police officer could leave, mm -hmm. and we have that data. If how many times they leave right joe i thought joe cook said that he has that we'd lo i'd love to see that because i'd like to see if that's happening is that truly a concern now that could happen this year but has it happened in the past where it's you know we have a police officer that is gone three days um out of the week or something i mean and that may be happening i i can't see that's happening though they provided subs in certain cases though yeah i mean they yeah i mean they're not leaving i mean because yeah. you know if something happens it's going to be on the police just as much as it's on the school district. So, I mean, I'd be mm -hmm. um, surprised if they are leaving the schools yeah, it's, and they're not coming back for... It is important to point out that those officers, though they're on site, are still under... Yeah, they're part the of the... chief is still... Yeah, he's the boss. He's still the boss. So According to the contract, yeah. mm -hmm. he's the boss, it says in there. And not only this contract, but their union contract. Yeah, right, because it says things, right so. in there they have to abide by... 
Right here, SRO duty hours shall be determined by the provisions of the labor agreement between the police department and the Wisconsin Professional Police Association. Whenever possible, it is the intent of the parties that SRO's duty hours conform to the school day. So, um, yeah, the collective bargaining agreement. That's ultimately driving. Is, right, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it guides that entire, yep. all their duties at school. That's not going to change. So, the, those are good questions. I can. But yeah, up. I would like that. I mean, the money. I totally get that they want. They want to be um, recoup their costs and sixty-five percent. I mean, yeah. I mean, you can count it up to see how much of their year, their fiscal year, they're at the schools. But I'd love to see how many if they leave because I know that um, Mr. O'Brien had brought that up in a meeting, mm -hmm. um, and Joe Cook said that he he does have that. Information. He does have that. I don't remember what the numbers were, but it, and that was a good question um, yeah. to ask. Is is your at that point you're counting days and minutes essentially? Yeah. Right. Um, so I can bring back that data to our next meeting. Yeah, I mean, if it's truly sixty five percent of the time, then I mean that's that's what you're ordering. So, but yeah, this the six day thing kind of. What uh, I don't know is we off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So just like yeah. Okay, so I'll bring back information on the um, six days before a sub is assigned and then the call-out data. Yeah, because, I mean, we had one that was on leave, and we did not go without coverage. In fact, the officer that covered them is now at North. That was the sub, and then she got the job. Oh, right. At North, that's, I mean, that's who, that's how, so I don't, I don't really know if we actually waited for six days. Yes, Mrs. Ranchuk. Um, and a couple things. As far as I also am bringing up something that Mr. Ryan had stated that was a concern for him, that um, we didn't get to choose who was there. Mm -hmm. If we wanted a say of who was better with kids, we didn't have a say. We were a, we were a seat at the table, but they weren't really listening to us. It was chief's decision who was going to be appointed to our schools. And of course, we want who's good with kids, but in speaking with some people in security and former police officers and former chiefs, they would, of course, choose the best person for, that's good with kids because it's going to make them look bad if their officers aren't good with kids. I mean, they're represented in our schools. Um, they want the best rep representation of them that they can that are the, of the, the officers that are good with kids as well. I mean, if they look bad, then the, the department looks bad. So, I mean, us leaving that up to them, us just in a, in a brief meeting, but them knowing their whole history, how they've trained, we can leave that up to them. But I, I guess the feeling of not having a say at all kind of is, is a little standoffish to me, but I mean, that was just Kurt's interpretation. I would really like to know what happens in those meetings. Do we get to say, of course, we want someone good with kids. And a lot of them have been working with us already, so they're already um, familiar with the kids. The kids are familiar with them. So I guess what does that look like, and can we? I can speak to, I wasn't comment. part of the last hiring process, but I believe it was a committee of five people Two of them were district employees. I think Mr. Or Dr. Cook sat in, and then I think it was the principal or maybe an assistant principal from the school that they were hiring. Um, but we do have an advisory role. Um, I don't want to speak for uh, Dr. Cook, but I, I do think they came to a consensus on who the officer was going to be. Um, but, also, but ultimately, we were just talking about it, it's the chief's call because of the union contract. And, and he's the boss. I mean, these are his staff. So... Um, I don't think there's no input. Um, what the percentage of our input is is open to interpretation probably, but I do think they hear, um, and actually if you look in here, I put into writing because before they started this process, I think just out of because they thought, because I, I, I think I, sh I share what you're saying, Karen, they want our input on having the best person there too, right? Because a lot of people meet right. that officer, they're interacting with that officer, so you want that good um, um, person in there that maximizes what they can do. But right here we have uh, the selection team for new SROs shall include at least two um, 
um, district representatives selected by the superintendent or his or her designee. In, case, in cases where an immediate reassignment is required, the police chief will work directly with the superintendent or his or her designee in the selection process. So um, we did, and that's in um, paragraph three sub C in the red. So, um, so we are at the table, but it's their call. It's their employee um, and, and the chief. Well, some of that is dictated by their own Contract. Union contract, yeah. which yeah. we don't Collective have bargaining. much control over. And if someone's not working out, we could we could request a change. I don't know that okay. we've had that situation yet. So okay. Um, and if you're looking for an answer because it's July and we need people in September, we're not, or unless we are meeting Additional in August, what is happening? September. Oh, okay. Additional people because we still have a contract. yeah. We have the four on we still a contract until. Yeah. With the current ones until 2021, mm -hmm. so this would be additional for okay. this year. So we would—it's not like we'd be completely unprotected at the at the high schools. But we could bring it. Looking at the contract that was emailed. It's not an action item. We're discussing. No, it's just discussion because I wanted everybody to know where we were. So. In this committee, because this is going to be something that the board is going to actually ultimately. I mean, we're not going to decide it here. I mean, you know, it's going to go to the board whether no matter what. Mm -hmm. it's, well, it's a decision definitely. that's going to be. I, I, hands down, would like the police versus another company, but that's just me. Excellent. Okay, anything else? Mrs. Voigt, you're looking, you're dying to say something. <laughs> well, well, my thought is, yeah, I, I, it seems like a late August kind of review yes. to move it no, from, agree. From, you know, from the previous time to the end of August. But at this point, we're starting the school year with four, and then we'll be considering adding two more. It, yes. After school starts, as the school year you know, rolls along, that is correct. Yep. Yes. Is it is there a possibility to push this so we can have it have six FTEs by beginning of the school year? Is that an option? Is that what we're being asked? Or no, always an option. I think if we haven't agenda. come to an agreement, um, they can start their process and then. If it's approved at the August board meeting, we should be yeah, The soonest we could get it approved now would be the August board meeting, which would be around the twelfth or something like yeah, that. Mid August. Okay. Um, or 10th um, so we can bring it back to this committee to you know we'll, cl we'll clarify those two questions that uh, Patrick had asked which are good ones and then we can bring it back as an action I mean if we agendize it as action the, the committee can table it as well so I mean you're not you're not required to take action um, right I'd like to see that the next the next meeting that that gives me a big question mark in my head so those officers, if let's say we say six, mm -hmm. middle of August, we all vote and it says we say six, then those officers have two weeks to get pulled off of whatever job that they're on and be trained on what has to, procedures in the school. Now you're dealing with just kids. This is what needs to happen. And, and here's the layout of the school. Here's the steps. All, everything that has to do with security. They only have two weeks. Some of them are actually who have been resource officers are, are back in the field who could be pulled back in, and we've done that as well. But like I said, if, we, if we're if we able to reach an agreement sometime, say, say mid-July, somewhere in that range, they can start preparing these people with, with the assumption that the board will approve the contract. So we only there's only one more. We have five in play. We have a five identified. There will only be one more, and we do have a few officers that have been uh, SROs that that could be pulled in if needed, or you know, while someone else trains. So, it's a, it's an excellent point, and I didn't think of it. So, there's there's an officer in the pipeline, or multiple that are adequately trained. Well, yeah, we had so. five this slash right. year. Yeah. One because was like uncontracted, although we had a special session to pay that one. But um, so we know there's five, and then I know of at least two others that are out there that are, are not SROs, but they're still on the force. So, I mean, there's a couple options we could use to kind of mitigate that two-week issue. Okay, so. very good. Thank you. And we could come back in August with a clear answer about how that transition would would occur if the committee wants to. Maybe, because I think I would hate to be here in August and then have be told then that the city says, look, we, don't, we just don't have the staffing. Yeah. So maybe give the city a heads up saying, hey, this is maybe coming.
All right, anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on. Other business. Recommendation for future committee meetings. Does anybody have any recommendations right now about any future meetings? If not, we can email Aaron and I and do you have one? I, no, no, no. Okay. Right. I was hoping <laughs> just generally not in my head. Usually. <laughs> anything? Answer. Because we can always. Just procedurally, is if, if it sounds like a dumb question, because it probably is, but if I have an idea of something we want, that's the avenue to do it? This is one of the avenues. You okay. can email Darren and I, and we can talk yeah. about <laughs> okay. it. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be done right now. All right. But we just added this to the um, agenda last year, okay. just in case. Grant check. Yeah, they added it because I always had things that I wanted to discuss or Good. people would come up to me in the public and say X, Y, and Z. And then at the end of the board meeting, I'd say, can we have a, a discussion on this? And they'd say, nope, this is not agendized. You cannot ask this. So now they've put it on the agenda to each time. Ask, does anybody have any ideas for future topics? Good. Makes sense. And I'm not part of the day. I'm not them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ready. So just let me know if there's anything, and Darren and I know if there's anything you guys want on the agenda or discussed. Okay. So we do have to adjourn to executive session, mm -hmm. correct? Yep. Um, does anybody want to make the motion? I can make the motion. Sure. Um, I move to adjourn to executive session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.85 parent 1 parent E. For deliberating or negotiating the purchasing of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. I'll second. Thank you. Is that roll call or can do it to do roll call? Roll call. Yeah. Ms. Foyt? Aye. Ms. Ranichek? Aye. Mr. Mate Mateo? Mateo. Aye. Mateo. Yeah, that's good. And Mr. McCaffrey? Aye. Or a weep. One absence.